So thanks everyone for coming to my uh, research in progress presentation. And uh, this will be about my thesis. And uh, uh, before that, I wanna share a little bit uh, about this interesting read. Uh, so there's this article on Forbes that was talking about uh, interesting topic about epistemic trespassing. So episte uh, epistemy is about how we know uh, what we know. So they were talking about during the COVID pandemic, how all the scientists are kind of shifting gears and working with the platform they had and trying to uh, combine COVID into that. And there, uh, I'm sure everyone has seen a lot of literature that is kind of uh, questionable in its methods, especially in terms of epidemiology. And so um, this article is trying to call attention to all of the uh, maybe take everything we know with a grain of salt since the COVID pandemic. And uh, the reason I want to bring that up is uh, about this article. Uh, so uh, Dr. Gaiha from Stanford actually uh, published uh, an article in May 2020. Uh, he was, uh, uh, so a little, a little background about Dr. Gaiha, he was studying uh, health policy and health allocation in Stanford. And he was working on the vaping population, young adults and adolescents, even before the COVID-19. And what he find from a national survey, uh, an online survey that used convenience sampling was that the odds ratio of uh, getting tested among the, uh, the vaping population is uh, significantly increased. So the testing, the odds, uh, the OR of testing is uh, almost three times more likely compared with the control group. And the COVID diagnosis, uh, positive diagnosis is about five times more likely. So uh, uh, there, what really got the, the media attention was that the uh, actual congressman was using this article as a scientific basis to push for like all around ban on the vaping products. And that uh, caused a lot of atten uh, discussion about the uh, scientific quality of this article. And there have been uh, discussions about the response bias. Uh, so they're sent out like 10,000 surveys and the only, uh, the response rate was about 30%. And uh, they're talking about how they might be biased and also limited generalizability to the whole population. And they're also uh, talk about how the exposure, the ECUs was uh, defined very uh, uh, inaccurately. And uh, also they are lacking in the choice of comparison group so, and that uh, actually coincides with the population that I'm working with, which leads to the topic uh, of today's presentation is uh, the electronic cigarette use and the COVID-19. Uh, it's a, a longitudinal survey that is uh, based on the, the Vapors cohort and a little background information about the Vapors study design. Uh, it is a controlled perspective cohort and uh, it was intended to study uh, the oral microbiome differences that, it, that might be associated with the electronic cigarette use. So it was intended uh, on the population of young, uh, young adults. And you also used a convenience sampling methods. Uh, so we, uh, it was building on the descriptive study that we had uh, in the Baltimore city that we uh, uh, report with the local vaping shops. So we were recruiting the vapors from the local vapor shops and uh, also from the internet, social media and other, uh, other methods. And we were trying to recruit the control uh, group with a similar co uh, covariate distribution in terms of age, ethnicity and race. And the exposure was defined as having used uh, electronic cigarette products uh, at the baseline visits for six months and longer. And uh, they were kind of verified with positive urine encoding test. And uh, and uh, in the design of that paper study, uh, neither group had the ex uh, extended cigarette smoking history. And uh, uh, let's look at the baseline characteristic of a vapors at the, at the baseline study. So uh, they were, uh, we were able to recruit this, uh, about 70 individuals in both groups. And uh, uh, on the left uh, column, I didn't show the p-value because the none of them were significant. And uh, uh, we can see that the included in the vapor study is uh, a young adults that is predominantly male and, uh, and that is represented in all race groups. And uh, in the 
uh, when we had a uh, when we want to, when we set out the invites to the COVID survey and uh, a sub study, a uh, sub population from the, the vapors cohort responded. And if you look at the gender, uh, that, uh, that is kind of, uh, actually kind of flipped. Uh, the, uh, the COVID uh, subsample is actually the percentages of the female gender. So they are quite similar in the male with the, the original whole cohort. And uh, uh, much of the balance was retained in terms of uh, ethnicity and race. So uh, about the timeline of the study, the Vapors recruit, uh, recruitment lasted from the June 2017 all the way to October 2018. And the original uh, plan of follow-up was two years. So they would include uh, uh, both uh, in-person visits that would schedule at baseline one year or two years since follow-up and also uh, monthly uh, surveys that was sent to the participants phone throughout the period to collect information about their uh, ECUs and also their uh, respiratory symptoms. And uh, uh, during, the co uh, during the COVID pandemic, we were able to put an amendment to the original protocol and uh, it was approved in uh, last April. And let's look at further baseline characteristic. So in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of their employment and marital status, uh, we can see that the vapors are more likely to be uh, are more likely to be uh, single and uh, uh, employed uh, employed for wages, but none of that showed uh, significance. Uh, we also collected information about their healthcare, uh, uh, their habits with healthcare visits. And we can see that the, uh, although we're paying attention to isolate the, the effect of EC on the R microbi uh, microbiome, there are still some uh, association that we detected uh, about EC with uh, less dental care visits, uh, less inclinations to get the flu vaccinations, and probably more with alcohol, uh, alcoholic drinks. So uh, maybe let's take a pause now. Uh, any question about the uh, study design and the baseline characteristics? Okay, and uh, uh, now let's move on to the uh, COVID survey uh, uh, study aims. We were trying to determine uh, whether the uh, electronic use, uh, uh, cigarette use is associated with increased testing behavior and diagnosis of COVID-19. And uh, we also integrated a qualitative uh, study that uh, would explore the risk mitigation measure, uh, measures that is suggested by the CDC and other uh, government guidelines. And also uh, more specifically, the change of EC use patterns uh, about the uh, following these public messagings and they would receive. So this is the study response by month. So in terms of the uh, study performance, uh, oh, sorry about that. Uh, well, we, uh, so far, we have nine waves of study uh, study responses so far, and uh, we see that uh, the original Vapors cohort included about uh, 150 individuals, and then in each month, we were still getting about 100 responses from both group, and uh, it was uh, it was probably more than satisfactory in terms of a cohort that has been going on for about two years, and uh, in terms of the testing by month, we're uh, that would be a uh, part of the primary outcome for the first aim. We, uh, we capture a lot of uh, outcomes. So uh, uh, by breakdown of that the ECU status, uh, of the 48 uh, EC users that in the subpopulation of the, the COVID service sample, we received uh, 23 uh, tests, uh, tests. And also the, for the non-EC users, we captured uh, 37 events. And uh, if we look at that, like longitudinally, uh, this would be the, 
a non-parametric survival estimation of that uh, of the in terms of COVID testing. Uh, we can see that two curves are heavily uh, overlapping each other, and uh, we we didn't run the log uh, rank tests, but it's probably uh, not significant. And what's notable is that a lot of the censoring is happening uh, within the 100 days, uh, and the anchor date is the February. The anchor date, the time zero, is actually the February 2020, and we can see that a lot of the loss to follow happened within the uh, first three months. And uh, uh, although it is a non-parametric uh, estimation, it still assumes the random censoring that is uh, non-informative in terms of, of the exposure and outcome. And uh, uh, also another thing noticeable is that all, the, all of the participants remaining in the survey got tested eventually. And the median time to get the first COVID test uh, for the EC group is 192 days. And uh, that is uh, about six months into the pandemic and also similar in the non-EC use groups. So any question about this, uh, this part? Okay, I'll go on then. So uh, in order to make some adjustment to make the EC and the non-EC group uh, similar in some covariates and uh, trying to make any uh, causal inference uh, about the EC use and uh, its potential uh, Im implication on the COVID-19 testing, we have to have a, a DAG that would uh, help us better uh, conceptualize the whole uh, potential confounders so the age, race, and gender is actually uh, blended with the original uh, vapors design that would uh, that is kind of known strong confounders of the microbiome. Uh, with the, and also uh, during the wealth of inflammation and the items we tested with the vapor study and also the COVID uh, survey, uh, we were able to uh, put in the education level, employment status, and marriage and living condition into this conceptually as a shin, and that might be associated with the COVID testing behavior. So I think this would be uh, uh, something that we can discuss maybe. Sorry, what do the two different colors represent? Oh, that, that the one on the above is the demographics and the one on uh, below that the cover stands for the SES, the social economic one. I see. Yeah. And Lynn, I'd be very careful with using the term DAG here. Um, I think this is loosely a conceptual framework, but I wouldn't call it a DAG per se. I think there are a few rules that are um, broken, so to speak. Uh, yes. And uh, and even among the, the factors themselves, there are probably no association with, within them that I didn't specify. Mm -hmm. So, uh, any questions about this? So if I'm interpreting this correctly, are you suggesting that all of the factors that are in red, they have some sort of interaction going on and all the ones in yellow, they have some sort of interaction going on? Uh, yes. Um, I'm kind of like putting the, uh, them together as a group mm -hmm. uh, because, yeah. I, I would probably, yeah, I would, I'd be curious where you draw some um, relationships between those covariates, not only within section like education level affecting employment status, um, but yeah. also between sort of the demographic and the others like age affecting employment status or race and ethnicity perhaps affecting employment status, right? The sort of other things that, I think there are other interrelationships um, between those that you probably want to look into um, and put relationships down if you want this to be a DAG, right? If you- Yeah. Um, yeah. And you're interested on whether or not they actually had the testing or are you interested in what the test results were? Uh, yeah, we'll get to that uh, when we look at the testing results. Uh, so uh, uh, we were able to capture about uh, 20 to 30 outcomes in each group. And uh, 
my original thoughts is that if we put all of those covariates as individual like uh, potential confounders in the adjustment or methods, maybe regressions, it might not fully be uh, like the model might be overloaded with the covariates and uh, just attenuate the whole like uh, strength of the association that we might detect with the EC, uh, from the ECUs with the COVID-19 testing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just, uh, uh, I went with the propensity score weighting. Uh, so one of the reasons I went with this was that uh, I probably assumed that the, it might be hard to, uh, you know, entangle and decipher the interrelationships between the potential confounders. So uh, propensity score might be a way to get out of that. And also uh, uh, is a great way to adjust for many covariates at once. And uh, by looking at the, so the left, uh, the y axis is actually the uh, index uh, indicator variables for different uh, uh, covariates that, that I put in the model uh, that is constructing the propensity score. And we can see that before the adjustment uh, with the propensity score, uh, that is uh, uh, actually the, this model uses the weighting methods. So before the propensity score uh, adjustment, we can see the, the two groups are not very comparable. And of, of the, those, uh, actually the, the age and gender ethnicity, some of that were taken out of that uh, construction because uh, that's, I think this model uses the auto, uh, uh, automated process and trying to combine all of the potential covariates. And before the uh, adjustment, we can see the absolute mean difference uh, of that uh, compares, comparing the two groups is about 1.5. That means that there are uh, great differences in terms of all the potential confounders we might be able to detect. And after the, uh, the adjustment, uh, we were able to uh, shrink that to uh, a little below 0.5. And the ideal situation is that uh, after adjustment, we would be able to look at the, the blue dots and see all of them uh, below 0.1. That would mean the the sample size and the outcomes, the number of uh, the sample size able to handle such uh, so many uh, covariates that we put in the constructing the propensity score. Yeah, so uh, again, this is very uh, early in uh, like trying to adjust all these covariates. But if we use a weighted uh, uh, kaplan meier curve, uh, and we can see that the two curves are still uh, heavily overlapping each other. And, uh, and in terms of medians, uh, there isn't much changing between the two. So going, going forward, I'll probably be, try to look at the heavy influencers with the propensity score and try to see uh, if there are any adjustment in constructing the uh, propensity score. Yeah, and you're doing double adjustment, right? So you're using the covariates and the propensity score weights. Uh, for this one, I haven't uh, used, uh, I'm using a propensity score in doing the weighting, actually. And you're also adjusting when you do your regression. Uh, no, I haven't do the, uh, are you talking about the double robustness? Mm -hmm. Like the putting, yeah, I haven't tried that yet because I'm still going over the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, whether the, like the propensity score would be an appropriate way of uh, dealing with this situation. Okay. But based on what, what, uh, what I have now, I'm, I would say that I didn't detect a, a, like a trend of uh, ECUs being associated with the COVID testing. So any thoughts on this graph? Oh, can I have a question? So in yep. this graph, you are um, measuring about the time to the first COVID-19 testing. Um, yep. Do you have any place to consider what if a, a um, participant doing multiple times um, COVID-19 testing? Do you take into consideration that? Yeah, I, I, I would say that uh, if we treat the COVID test as a, as a recurrent event, we would have us to assume that the second test, uh, actually the, the risk of uh, 
that we have to take the the first test and the second test as uh, separate events that the the first there isn't any leftover effect from getting the first test with the second test which is probably not true in real life yeah that is why i didn't include that as a recurrent event and uh, we actually captured 80 tests in total and 60 of them being the first time test and uh, that means about 20 individuals got tested the second time so i would assume that the this uh, select groups of individuals who get repeated tests will be very different. Uh, their risk uh, of getting the test would be very different with, compared with their first test. So that is the reason I, want, I only select the first test as the outcome. So any other suggestions? Hi, Lin. Uh, Hi. This is Lin. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. So, yeah, so so it, it I'm ha having a hard time trying to, you know, distinguish these two curves. Uh, but I think you could try different, you know, survival, parametric survival models. For example, you can try restrict, restricted mean survival time uh, because that will compare the areas like under the two survival curves because they seem a little bit different to me. Um, maybe you can find some signal trying different models. For example, you know the you know the proportion of person getting at each survival um, proportion at, at different time and the speed they get there. So I think you could try parametric survival models. Yeah, yeah. You mean like the the GG models and something uh, with more. Uh... Yeah, GG uh, model or the restricted restricted mean time, mean survival time. Yeah, uh, there's a uh, still a lot to be uh, discussed about the actually the structure of the, the propensity score. Yeah, because everything, uh, even the weighting methods, the construction of the propensity score is heavily relied on the kind of the ideal conceptualization of the exposure, the outcome, and the covariance. Mm -hmm. And that is where I want to get gather everyone's opinions on that. And uh, uh, probably that would be the first step before going on with the adjustment. Yeah. And but also, uh, I would I would try the, G, uh, the GG models after this, uh, going into more parametric. And also I was wondering how, how, like, how large is your sample size after 150 uh days is it days in time uh yes but, uh let me go back to the first uh, so uh when we send out our first survey actually the the total sample size of this longitudinal survey was uh 108 people and when we send out uh, uh, the first salary we got that number of response and after that each month we were able to stabilize around 80 80 people uh, 80 responses each month and mm -hmm. that is uh yeah about uh, half of those in each group 40 40 people in each month yeah so because you have a small sample size so i was wondering by the end of the couple of mare curve it might mm -hmm. be that the the two curves cross because there are just the small, the sample size is just too small, but before 150 days, where you have larger sample size, there was a difference there. Although I don't know the biological mechanism or I don't know if it's artificial. Um, just yeah, I think, yeah, that makes sense. I was uh, worried about the same thing, that actually the depletion of the susceptibles of the sample, everyone's getting tested. So uh, would you, suggest that uh, breaking up this analysis into maybe the first half of that follow-up period. And I'm just not sure because uh, testing itself is also associated with other uh, trend and maybe the uh, availability of the test uh, testing in Maryland. Yeah, I was, I was wondering if we could like review the literature to see if there is an like recommendation of how much sample size at the end of the survival curve that you need to have, like to be able to extrapolate long enough because when you have really small 
risk set, then the end of the survival curves doesn't give you much information. Yeah. And also, I, if I remember correctly, I, I don't think the, some of the parametric models are very adept at the, dealing with the curves that cross each other. So that might be problematic in this interpretation. Do you agree, Lynn? Like I, I see this very sharp drop here at like after 150 in time. Mm -hmm. So th these sh like sudden drop, it might be because of the small sample size. But if you look at the survival, the two survival curves behind before 150, there's actually a difference there. So I'm just wondering if the if the cross is because of the small sample size. And yeah. like even if two survival curves cross, some parametric models can actually be informative. Yeah, I was gonna say I think there's some that are actually better at handling when the non proport like when that that non proportionally isn't met. There's some that are mm -hmm. better for handling that than yeah. just like a standard Cox. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, uh, going forward. Um, so that this sums up my analysis so far with the aim one. And uh, so the next step would we'll try to examine the propensity score uh, distribution among the two groups. And actually I uh, detected some like the heavy influencers. I'm still trying to uh, uh, trying to understand those. Uh, so the ideal case uh, would be that uh, uh, the ways of individuals doesn't, because I'm using ATT, the ideal uh, case would be the, the ways of individuals doesn't, in the control group doesn't surpass one, but I have a lot of uh, ways for individuals in the control group that are like five or seven. Uh, that is used to suggest a strong uh, confounding, like uh, a residue confounding that is associated with those covariates in terms of the ECUs and yeah. Um, okay, that those are good suggestions. So after that, maybe Taylor, you can stop recording and let me change into. Okay, yes, I will, no problem. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>